Good morning, afternoon, everyone, evening. Um, this is uh, Nina Olson. I'm the executive director of the Center for Taxpayer Rights. And um, this is our third tax chat. Um, and the topic of this tax chat is the anthropology of tax. Um, I was very excited to do this. Um, I'm pressing into service uh, our guests today. I've worked with them over the years in various conferences and workshops, and I've learned so much from them uh, that I really feel that you, the, the contribution that we'll make in our discussion today will be very um, interesting for everybody on this chat. So I'm not going to take a lot of time uh, introduce, giving you their bio backgrounds. We've provided links um, about this in the in the emails going out, but just introduce the folks that we have today on the program, our tax chat program. Lotta Bjorklund Larson is um, currently a research fellow at the Tax Administration Research Center, TARC at the University of Exeter Business School. And she's the author of a really fascinating book, Shaping Taxpayers' Values in Action at the Swedish Tax Agency. Uh, as well as a lot of other articles and working on a lot of different projects. Um, Johanna Mugler is a lecturer and researcher at the Institute for Social Anthropology at the University of Bern in Switzerland. And she was a member of the International Max Planck Research School on Retaliation, Mediation and Punishment. Her current research project is um, uh, the emergence of global taxpayers. And she's going to talk a lot about some of her work that she's been doing, you know, exploring some of the, the development of international tax po policy programs at OECD, et cetera. We have Nemo Elmi, who is a PhD research fellow at the Institute of Technology and Social Change at Linköping University in Sweden. And her current research is going to be presented in a upcoming book, her upcoming book, Digital, Digitalizing Taxation, The Travels and Translations of ITAX in Kenya. And this is some of the stuff that she's going to talk about today, her field work in Kenya. Um, so I just, we're going to talk, cover basically three, you know, a whole bunch of topics, but they're going to sort of fall in three categories. Um, one thing is to just really have a chat about the anthropological method in the first place, you know, the ethnographic methods, field work, et cetera, because some people may not be familiar with how this is, um, you know, how this is applied. And they're basically the, the methodology that goes with anthropo anthropological research. And then we'll talk about the various areas of study that each of our guests have been working on, as I mentioned, Swedish tax administration, fair taxation in Kenya, and the making of international tax norms at OECD. And finally, we'll sort of have a discussion about the anthrop anthropology vis-a-vis -vis other um, disciplines that might be working in the field of tax. So um, first, I think I'm just going to ask folks how they got, um, and then also, if you have a question as we're going along with this tax chat, because it is supposed to be informal, um, if you have a question, you can put it in chat and, you know, we'll try to weave it into the conversation as we go along. Otherwise, we will definitely reserve time at the end for you all to ask questions, you know, yourselves on mute, et cetera, and, and um, just we can have an we can have the chat broader than just the four of us. So the first thing that we really wanted to, I wanted to ask the folks is how you actually got interested in the anthropology of tax. People know a lot about anthropology, you know, Margaret Mead, et cetera, Samoa, but how did you get from that work to tax? Um, so do you, who wants to take a stab at that and be sure to unmute yourself? Um, who wants to start? Lada, do you want to start? Yes, I can start. Um, first of all, thank you, Nina, so much for inviting us for this. We have collaborated among ourselves, but also with you in numerous occasions. And it's, it's really a pleasure to be able to share this discussion and see if we can probe further. So we also look forward, I think, collectively, I can say that, to qu any questions. Um, how I came to an anthropology of tax is actually two parts of that, If so if I may. I'm a latecomer to academia. 
I came to anthropology after working in financial software business for many years. And my customers were banks engaged in the same type of business in trading and dealing with each other. Yet being and working with banks in New York City, in Zurich, Paris, and even in cities across the Nordic countries were quite different. Same business, same software, dealing with each other, yet they functioned very differently. Was it, could it be culture? So anyway, I'm, I'm convinced that the same goes for tax administrations. In addition, in addition to the banks, we have different laws, different taxes, which complicates things further. Then I started studying anthropology and I took a PhD writing how you justify purchases of what in Swedish is called black work, which is more or less tax cheating. And how did we define this black work as it were? Um, it wasn't the law and the law, it wasn't the interpretation of the Swedish tax administration. And the law said all exchanges having value, regardless of compensation mode, are seen to constitute income. So how to draw the line between a helping hand and a taxable service? And that was the question that really proved me into starting engaging with the Swedish tax administration. So I asked them and I started to search people up there and I got the question or the answer from someone who thought it was actually a very silly question. It is common sense, she said. But the manager of the analysis department thought it quite an interesting question, all the one that is seldom brought out in the open because they, that is not something they want to discuss. So I was invited actually to follow a risk analysis project. And that's how I came into the anthropology of tax via the tax cheating side. Um, jo Johanna, you want to talk about how you got part pulled into this? Yes, I'm also happy to talk about it. And thank you, Nina, for, for having me. Um, yeah, while, while taxation is a very relevant and a very fruitful topic for anthropologists, it's still a very small, uh, new emerging field within anthropology and a very great lens for us to, to into any kind of society, whether small or big or even an emerging world society. Um, I have to admit, I, I did not wake up one day and I made a decision to, to study international tax norms at the OECD in Paris. I, I also came to the study of taxation through my previous work. And here I looked at the social and political implications of globally growing demands for more quantitative forms of accountability in, in settings where we, which are not so easy quantifiable, namely such as justice. And I explored this large issue, issue as we, we like to say in a very small place, namely the a specific place, namely the South African um, National Prosecuting Authority and observing these prosecutors, how they account for the money they receive from governments with performance indicators, statistics and rankings and how they draw up budgets and, and so on. This really made me interested in the in the money of the state. And this, this fits into the larger field of anthropology, which is called the anthropology of, of the state and organizations. And, and I was asking me, you know, where, where is this money coming from? And then my research focus moved then a step back from looking at how our specific norms and rules and standards are being implemented and what kind of effects they have um, to the question of who makes very specific rules and regulations that have a very crucial impact on any kind of um, state capacity to govern, who makes them in the first place. And while I could have researched that question also in a, in a national context, um, I decided to, to look at the international level due to the changing nature of our economies, for example, through global value chains, but also through processes of, of digitization. Um, so the larger question which is driving me, you know, what do people and, and countries owe to each other across borders? And that's kind of what, what keeps me up awake. Yep. <laughs> and that's actually really interesting because that issue was very much discussed in our immediately preceding tax chat on, on taxpayer rights, human rights, and sustainable development goals in this global environment. What is, 
where you have solidarity and cooperation, but you also have to raise revenue in order to meet the sustainable development goals for your own population. Um, so Nemo, you want to chat about, you know, your work and what brought you to the anthropology of tax? Uh, yes. Thank you, Nina, for this opportunity to demystify what tax anthropology is. Um, I got into the anthropology of tax as an economic anthropologist. Um, during my master's studies, I was looking at how development aid was being used in developing countries to strengthen the notions of democracy, um, post-conflict development and, and things like that. So coming in as an uh, anthropologist already looking at the economic aspect of, of uh, taxation was not quite difficult. Yeah? And then being also very interested in the post-colonial question, I was always understanding that taxation meant something quite different in developing countries as it did in um, developed nations. So just changing my lens from looking at it from like development aid and looking at it as, as taxation as being as a tool of post-colonial um, remnants. So I came into it trying to understand, uh, for example, what digitalization now means to African countries, specifically uh, Kenya, the case that I'm using for my PhD study. And what I found was a correlation between um, what, the, what the colonial administration was using taxation for and what people you know, perceived uh, taxation to be. So as an anthropologist, naturally, um, you get to understand that you have to really understand taxation then from a human perspective and not only from what the law says or what economic, economists say. Yeah. So it was really important that um, we connect those two aspects. And I think because anthropologists have been historically trying to understand um, different uh, phenomena, like uh, what are the effects of the post-colonial um, administrations and you know issues like taxation, were the post-colonies able to come up with their own way of taxing or have they just adapted to the systems that were in place before independence? And uh, I also came in as, as, as a research fellow on a fair tax project that Lotte and I were working on. And it, it, it connected quite naturally to try and look at whether this new policies that were being implemented were quite fair for, for example, taxpayers in Kenya. Um, were they equipped to have uh, the digital systems that they were being forced to use? Because uh, the digital system that I have been studying is called ITAX. And this was made mandatory for the taxpayers to use. And with an assumption that everybody has access to, to the internet, internet infrastructure that is needed to support this shift. So, um, I think that for me is what got me really geared up to bring anthropology and tax together. Yeah, I'm going to be really interested to hear more about that because, you know, for the last 18 years or 20 years, I've been screaming or not screaming, but fussing at the IRS that, you know, we have 41 million U.S. taxpayers, people filing returns that don't have broadband access. I mean, you know, why broadband access in their homes. And if we're going more and more digital, that's 41 million human beings that are left behind. And in the context of a pandemic, they can't go to the places where they would normally get Wi-Fi or some kind of broad like act libraries or coffee shops that have Wi-Fi and things. And what's the consequence of that? And really having to think about that. So this will be, I'd be really interested to hear. So when you've studied, when you all have studied Swedish tax administration, or as you were saying, Nemo, you know, fair taxation in Kenya, or the making of international tax norms at OECD. Can you just describe, you know, precise, you know, how you go about that um, as anthropologists? How are you approaching that study? Lada, do you want to start again, or somebody else? Yeah. Yes, I can start. Thanks. Um... When we go out in the field, I mean, I sort of our, how to say, our preferred way of studying is called what we call participant observation. We try to be there. We try to understand what makes people do certain things. I came to the Swedish tax administration very much interested in how they interpreted the law. And it became a project very much of what type of knowledge do they use when they interpret the law? And in that sense, also try to make taxpayers 
comply with with the uh, with the law, which is in this case very all encompassing. So anyway, so I was I was basically there when they did collective works following a risk analysis project, basically from start to finish. So I was there in their collective discussions, this task force. I was copied on all their emails. I participated in work in progress when they presented their work for managers, for colleagues, for the director general. And also when they gather the data, I, again, I was most interested in the type of knowledge that shaped their, that, uh, that constituted this, uh, the results of the analysis uh, of the risk analysis project. And that meant also sitting in on at a call center where they uh, called up 2000 Swedish taxpayers. So I listened of how that type of uh, data got processed, what type of question they asked, why they asked certain questions. I also followed a, a random audit control when they went out and checked or controlled 400 taxpayers, again, addressing these issues in the risk analysis project. And following these type of, yes, you could say that, yes, a random audit control, the results of that, yes, the results of a certain questionnaire that comes into percentages and numbers and so forth. But there are also all the other knowledge, the anecdotes, the stories they share, how they get insights into these discussions back and forth and up and down, and which very much shapes also the, um, the results they present. Sometimes those anecdotes are used to find the, the um, quantitative data, but other times they also discard quantitative results based on their knowledge of what taxpayers actually do. So, um, I mean, basically, we, you know, we can never be in people's heads, but we can try to understand as much as possible of what makes people do, say, and write certain things. Yeah, you know, I think fundamental, I, I've never understood why anyone would go into tax if they weren't curious about why people do the things that they do. You know, it's not, it's not just a formula. I mean, we're dealing with human beings and, you know, we're trying to get them to do certain things and better understand what motivates them and how they react to things. Mm -hmm. So, Johanna, you, Johanna, you want to talk about, you know, how you went about uh -huh. OECD, which many people would view as a closed community. Goodness gracious, how did you get in? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, maybe it's important for non-anthropologists to understand that that anthropologists have been for a long time going to places where there are outsiders, where there are where they don't speak the language, and and whether they're also maybe not welcome. And we are over the, you know, this is our discipline that we're very well trained to adapt ourselves to research settings where we, yeah, just don't know the, the rules of the game. And, and uh, but where we are there to, to learn, to listen, and, and to be very open minded to understand the inner logic of a specific field. And we have often the privilege maybe to other uh, fields that we have longer research uh, period. So we're just, we're not just there for the time of an interview, but as, as Lotta already mentioned, we, this goes on for months or even like years. And this, this long engagement helps obviously to build trust to specific key actors who then gave, give us access to the more hidden or maybe the more informal and the more ambiguous aspects of of life or within an organization or, or in, 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 mostly in, in private people's life. But I mean, in my case, it's an, an organization. And, um, and these kind of aspects, people don't want to usually share immediately with a stranger. And so what I did, I mean, I, I, as Lotta said, we need, we can't just work with interviews. We need, we need to observe. And especially these very busy people, it's important that um, I was able to get access to settings where I could observe them without necessarily bothering them because they're very often very busy. So in the public consultation meetings at the OECD was, was the first access point for me, which was very easy to access because you can register. And without much 
while these are not the actual negotiations, these are a part of it. That is, you, you can observe uh, key actors and get an idea of you know, who's involved, you hear about. I mean, I was interested in the process of the process of you know, what actually, what processes are being followed that a consensus is, is being found and what different levels are there within the OECD. And this was very fruitful. And yeah, and then here I was able to you know, get a get a first idea who are the experts in this field and who's being heard and whose views are being excluded and then you know who what processes are there to, to set the agenda or you know the, all the stuff which happens actually before the agenda setting that people wanted some things on the agenda but other countries were able to push that off the um, ag agenda and or what are the processes for raising complaints and these are all very classical anthropological questions in a way and because I I, I followed then these experts also not from the OECD also to international tax conferences um, from Mumbai to South Africa to Rio de Janeiro I mean the more I was present, the more impressed they were that I took this job seriously to understanding their working environment. And this then also helped me to get access to, um, yeah, to the Center for Tax Policy and Administration at the OECD, the Secretariat, where they do you know, a lot of background work in, in trying to bring countries together and also to actual negotiations. So yeah, I think the, 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 the problem for us is not necessarily the the, the access is just logistically a very demanding type of research. Yeah. yeah. So Nima, what about Kenya, your work in Kenya? Yeah, um, as my two colleagues have explained, there's a lot of things that go into participant observation. But one of the things that I met in my field work was that the, the view people had about anthropologists because historically anthropologists were used by colonial administrations to divide and rule the people. So there was a lot of explaining and a lot of convincing that had to go on that I was not here to harm anybody with the information that I was collecting. And there was always that question, you know, why would an African anthropologist start studying its own people? You know, like it, it was quite um, hilarious that that was a one observation that I got. But I think it was also important that we show how anthropologists has evolved over the years that we are no longer collecting information to harm people but you know we were actually trying to help so my research um i tried to to get a holistic perspective because i was like i'm going to give all the actors in my research a voice whether it's the technologists who are developing the the, the itax um, platform or the tax administration or the taxpayers i didn't i did not feel it would be fair for me to spend four years of research and writing up and not giving all these actors a voice in the research. So it was kind of, uh, I spent some time at the uh, Revenue Authority and then I spent some time with the taxpayers, really just trying to follow, you know, where this takes me. And it took me to service centers where taxpayers were, had to stand in line for hours, trying to get um, themselves to comply with the system. Then it took me to the tax administration when they, they were grappling with all the issues regarding um, shutting down the system for some people or even going to areas that have been marginalized because of this shift, because some areas have not yet de developed like the rest of Kenya. So, because historically, uh, a lot of the development in Kenya um, was connected to infrastructure. So the people who are connected to infrastructure, be it the railway, be it um, whatever modern infrastructure it be, then that came with the development. And there are some areas that do not even have mobile, uh, a 2G connection, like the, what they have the most is 2G connectivity. And you can imagine trying to connect on a smartphone or get on the internet with 2G connectivity. So it was important for me to go to all these areas that A, had been empowered because of this shift or had been marginalized uh, because of this shift to kind of just make sure that everybody got a voice. And I think anthropology stands out when it comes to holistically understanding issues like what we are studying, you know. And um, one of the things that I can say uh, were quite uh, aha moments for me were just like, you know, when people are just like, oh, so this is what anthropology is. This is something that we should be taking, or this is something that we should be engaging more because you actually take us quite seriously, you take our concerns quite seriously. So I moved from being somebody who 
people were actually quite reserved to talk to to somebody who people felt like I had become an ally, you know. And not that I had told them I was an ally because I had to be quite uh, neutral. But uh, as we all know, you can you cannot be so neutral when you're doing research. So yeah, but I think those are the holistic trying to get holistic perspectives is quite uh, key in anthropology. You know, we you sort of talked about this. You know how you collect your data and what it's basically comprised of, and we've touched on the general openness to those kinds of data, but I'm sort of interested about, you know, you were talking about keeping an open mind. How do you account for your own biases? I, I, I can go for uh, Lotta, go ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead, Nemo. Yeah, as I was saying, it's, it's not quite, it's not clear cut you know, just saying that, you know, you have to quite keep checking yourself all the time, especially with this whole notion of going native. Uh, you can sometimes get caught up in the field that you're studying and you have to quite, you have to practice reflexivity all the time and ask quite uh, important questions. Um, why am I following through with this um, part of the research? Why is it important for me? Because uh, as, a, as a researcher, you're still a human being and there are things that you can become passionate about. And as I said, uh, I have always been very passionate about understanding the post-colonial question. And I had to rein myself in quite so many times so that I could actually see whether it was me speaking or it was the field. And so a lot of reflexivity is, is required when, when doing such field work. Okay, Lada, do you wanna add anything to that? Yes, yes, I was, um, I mean, as Nemo says, this reflexivity of what we are of our prejudices and what you know what we observe but and of course anthropology is not at all about statistical representation or correlations about things but instead we sort of we also have to assess when we're saturated with data when we don't hear new things anymore that's when when sort of our field work should stop because obviously we can go on forever and and trying to understand more listen more hear more collect different stories so it's um so it's very much about recognizing that of trying to be open-minded trying to have the holistic sense be open for new ideas and yet still sort of restrain the field as it were in order to be say to to be able to say something about something so you know, Eric Kirkler asked the question, um, in concert conversations, negotiations, et cetera, people often pursue hidden agendas. How can you detect hidden agendas of agents by observations? That's a great question. Anyone want to take a stab at that? Johanna, you yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, people also say people lie or, or they, they, they don't tell the truth or, but what we are interested, or if you are present, are you, if you are present in an office observing someone preparing negotiations, if you sit there, don't you affect the research results? And I think for us, this, this a specific moment is not necessarily so important because we look for these patterns, yeah, right? we, we, I mean, if there's one occasion that we don't believe that's maybe that that's the, not the most important thing. But if you if you see something over and over again, um, then double it. You know, you would ask maybe also your research participants. I observed this. You know, is there something to it, or how would you you try to like? I mean, we say we triangulate the data. So you have the observations, you go back maybe to an interview, then you try to find it in the documents or you go to different experts um, would double check with them what they think about this issue. So I think that's how we, how I would answer that um, questions and yeah. Anybody else want to address that? Yeah, I, I can add to that. Um, I have had to leave out a lot of valuable information that I did not feel was genuine uh, because you feel like the informant was just telling you what you wanted to hear. And it, it was quite painful because everybody, everybody wants to leave the field with all this amazing data and write this amazing write-up for what you've been doing in the field. But I think you, as a researcher, you also have to sometimes weigh and, and, and trust your gut feeling about what you're being told and how genuine that is. But that being said, um, it is quite difficult to be able to 
detect hidden agendas. I think if somebody could uh, come up with <laughs> maybe a way of doing that, it would be quite valuable for the kind of work we're doing. But we, we normally just, um, we, we establish relationships with our informants. Um, so I think before you actually sit down with an informant, we establish rapport uh, so that you can be able to collect the, the valuable data that you need. But there, there has been a lot of valuable data in my view that I have had to leave out from analysis because it was just not leading me anywhere. <laughs> You know, um, when we had our meeting last October, there was a workshop in Sweden last October with a bunch of um, tax anthropologists. And as I was sitting there listening to everybody, it dawned on me that I had spent four decades of doing field work, working in, you know, representing taxpayers and then being the national taxpayer advocate and field work in tax administration and just trying to understand taxpayers. And, you know, for me, one of the most extraordinary things that happened in my career was, was, you know, spending 2016 and going out to taxpayers around the United States and holding public forums and just hearing what they had to say um, about their needs, what they, you know, needed to have in the way of services and assistance from the IRS, et cetera. And it was all types of taxpayers and tax professionals. It was fascinating. And it was overwhelming. I'm, you know, the the volume of information you're getting when you're just receiving. So, you know, can you? I, I learned things from that experience, um, and I'm wondering if you all could talk about just that that work of, you know, your ethnographic method methods and your field work, and you're just being there. Can you give me an example of? you know, something that you learned, you know, specific things that you would not have understood otherwise? Can I just, before we go to that, if, if I may add something to Eric's uh, question there, because I, I think what Johanna was talking about was being persistent. That is really, really important in this case. I mean, because after you've been there and you've been there again and you engage with these people, I mean, they sort of lose their guard. And it's, it's, it's not that we reveal things, but we try to just unpack and uncover and, and what it means to be human, more or less, right? And that, that is the beauty of it, I would say, but it also can take a long time. So it's, um, yeah. Sorry, Nina, for interrupting your question there. But yeah, maybe I, I also had an, just an, another thought about the word hidden agenda. I mean, in my work, it was then interesting how different delegates would talk about the hidden agenda of another country. Or if someone tried to, we, we looked at a situation together and then the person, you know, tried to give me his or her interpretation of this person's agenda. And then you kind of, for, for us, it's an interesting, what kind of patterns can we detect what, uh, how people perceive certain hidden agendas? I mean, that's what we would probably focus on, you know? not necessarily on, as, as Lotta just said, revealing a specific hidden agenda no one heard about. Yeah? Right. Right. So what about, what about, you know, just something that you learned through your methods that you wouldn't have learned utilizing other methods? Yeah, maybe, maybe I can start. I mean, when I, when I, I, before I worked in a national context in South Africa and with South African prosecutors, and I come from Germany, I lived in Switzerland. So, you know, it was all very clear in, in what kind of setting I'm working. And when I entered the field of international tax experts, I, you know, I was influenced by literature, anthropological literature, which looked at the making of human rights norms and the way they are being negotiated at the UN. And the description was that it's you know, a rather international setup. And while I was aware that economic norms or, or fiscal norms might be done differently because the, 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 the stakes are different, I was still very much surprised when I then encountered the field that, um, that what international means is here is slightly different and you know you, the world the, the, the field is called international law and you see all the number plates 
of the various countries and actors on, on these tables. Um, but then the number of people and uh, first the number of countries, but then also specific actors from these countries, like how small the number actually is who participates um, in the process, you know, is very limited. And that was surprising to me. And, and then to look at the kind of historical past dependencies, you know, who has the expertise in sp this specific field and who has the capacity to develop expertise and whose expertise is it then which becomes internationalized that was uh, very interesting for me mm. it makes you, you know, carefully think what international means in, in a specific setting nemo you want to go you want to like something that you like yes um for me it was uh, when i spent time at the revenue authority uh, working with uh, or rather observing the technologists who developed ITAX, um, I discovered that they really developed this system not for taxpayers but for the tax administration. And this was demonstrated by how they were able to really um, work with the technology, um, make changes that the administration uh, was suggesting. And this was not something that was coming from the taxpayers or things that the taxpayers were struggling with, but these were recommendations that the administration kept on making. So at the end of the day, the system was working well for the tax administration, but not the taxpayer. So it was actually able, I was able to really analyze, you know, from the intended use of the technology to the actual use, like who was this um, platform designed for and why was it designed? And it, I would have not been able to understand it if I had not, um, conducted field work or even made an attempt to to talk to the technologists or talk to the people uh, at the revenue authority with regards to why the system was so important and why it was important for them to make it mandatory. So one of the comments I got during my field work was, oh, this is really a good tool for us to administer, you know, the taxes. And I was like, how about how about taxpayers? Like, what say do they have? Because the platform was only in one language, it was all in English and not the other language uh, that is used in Kenya, Kiswahili. And it, it, it was not something that they were really paying attention to because it was like, oh, this system really works for the administration. However, they were not able to understand why so many taxpayers were not able to comply with the system. So they kept on talking about the numbers who had registered, but they were not talking about the numbers who had actually used this platform successfully because it was something that was designed and developed for the tax administration. Uh, and I would have not been able to ga gain that information if I had not been at their headquarters, um, asking them the relevant questions, or even just understanding how they engage with the system and how they talk about the system. Yeah. You know, one at one point when the IRS was contemplating you know, moving to a purely digital system, um, an incredibly high ranking official said at a meeting, a non-public meeting, you know, well, this will let us be able to get rid of the phones. And, you know, they denied it over and over and over and over again, but I was at that meeting and I was taking contemporaneous notes. So um, they couldn't deny it too much, but that, it was that sort of thing where publicly what they're saying is no, 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 we never wanted to get rid of the phones, but, but, and it actually, by having someone actually having articulated that, that actually changed the trajectory. It, you know, they had to look at what they said and then have to, you know, bring that back off the ledge. You know, well, we're not going to get, there are people always going to be using the phones, you know, that sort of thing. But it was very, it was a very interesting dialogue, if you will. So maybe that leads, you know, and Lila, you can address this too, but listening to Nemo, I was thinking, well, now, okay, you've had this observation that they designed this system. Um, do you, in this process, do you share that with them, like mirror it back to them in order for them to change their behavior? Or are you just ob observational? And, you know, uh, it's part of your research, but you're, it's not, you know, it's not necessarily your job isn't to change their behavior. Uh, yeah, so one of the things that I mentioned to them, because I was asking them about the user perspective in this technology, and it, it became quite evident that that was not something that they consider. Uh, 
and um, getting the user to participate in the design of the technology that they would be using and trying to make it user friendly. And so they, as I was asking the questions, I could see that they were asking me some questions uh, because also they realized I am a fellow at the Institute of Technology and Social Change. And it was a lot of questions that they were asking, but they did not want to show outright that what they were doing is, is, is not, you know, helping the taxpayers but I could see there was an interest in uh, exchanging information and one of the things that uh, one of the one of the requirements to my access was that I would come back at a later date and, and actually share my data with them once I'm, I, I publish so I still have to hold that uh, part of my deal uh, hopefully later next year then I would be able to go and do that but there was quite a misunderstanding about why the taxpayer is important in, the, in design of the technology that they would be using as in as in, in any technology that is developed the user is quite important but um, the tax administration and, and as you said Nina with the example of the IRS tend to quite to forget that the taxpayer should be involved in design and I think that is quite key so I will be including that in my recommendations. I don't know how much they would listen, but it's 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 worth a shot getting it out there. Right, Lara. Um, I found actually great interest from the tax administration in what what I had to say, at least initially. But uh, it's it's a different story because then they change the analysis work they're doing to completely reorganize that. But um, I can take another example in this fair tax project that Nimo and I participated in. I, I led a, a research project where we looked at cooperative compliance projects around in the northern Europe, and I coordinated the the Nordic countries. And lo and behold, as admired and respected the Swedish tax administration is among the Swedish population, despite that we pay a lot of tax, which is perhaps, how to say, strange for some economists to think about this. But when it came to this cooperative compliance project, the Swedish experience was a complete failure. But we organized because I had promised them to come back with my results uh, and discuss it with all the informants I had. So well, I was at the um, Confederate of the Swedish uh, Entrepreneurs, and I was also with, um, uh, with corporate taxpayers, as well as the Swedish Tax Administration. And going into there and presenting a report with basically the heading is Sweden, a failure of cooperative compliance, made me swallow once or twice, right? But they took it in, in, in fair spirit. And um, I had put a question mark after my title. And then or after five hours of workshop, talking with this task force who had been working with the cooperative compliance project, and someone you know, ushered me out. And he said, well, get rid of that question mark, he said. <laughs> so I think that this open-mindedness to you know, not uncomfortable truths, if you like, is also very well respected. And therefore, I, I think that, you know, we can contribute something, but it's not always, how to say, patting the dog. What do you say in English? I lose my words here now, but always being kind. We try to be polite, but we will try to be truthful with our, our insights. So, um... What's your interaction with, you know, other people that work in the tax field, you know, in other disciplines? How is, how is anthropology, you know, perceived? Do you want to touch that? How is it different from the work that other tax scholars do? And I'll, even within your own discipline, you know, you all came over um, in 2017, maybe, I can't remember what year it was, when we had the uh, American Anthropology Anthropological Association have their meeting in Washington, D.C., and we did a panel at the ungodly hour of 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning, and there were more people on the panel than in the audience, you know, which, you know, some of that might have been the Sunday, but it, you know, we all walked away thinking we have some education to do just within the discipline itself. 
yeah maybe maybe i can um add something to that because when you asked you know how whether our knowledge is being used to whatever improve the kenyan uh, tax system or, or also for the in terms of the taxpayer or um i find that the work we do is tremendously helpful also for developing you know anthrop anthropological thinking it, it it brings very new questions to the field which haven't been asked before or um and i find this this physical knowledge we are producing right now very fruitful also for our students i mean taxation has affected so many aspects of our lives and i think you know students realize they are interested in that but they feel also incompetent to to have that physical knowledges and in in this our our job also to provide that knowledge so we can you know bring a gap to to make them more comfortable with with taxation which many people are aren't feeling comfortable with even if they're highly educated and you know super smart well i can add to what johan has just said um my first interaction with tax scholars was during a conference uh, I participated maybe in my second year of my PhD studies. And I remember after my presentation, um, I, there were some economists and some tax legal scholars who were sitting in the audience. And one of the questions I got was, where are the statistics for this, um, for this work that you're presenting? And uh, another one asked, oh, so how is this, you know, from a legal perspective, you know, how can you make this argument? So I was either expected to be an economist or a legal scholar for me to be able to sit there and actually claim what I was claiming with my, with my research. Um, I think uh, fast forward two years later, uh, last year I was invited to a conference where I actually sat in a panel and they were using some of the the work that I'm doing to make, you know, come up with a lot of, oh, yes, we should actually listen to the taxpayers, we should do this. So it was quite refreshing to see that we've come a long way, um, but it was not easy. It was not easy to get them to take our work seriously. And as Johanna said, a lot of the work that we're doing quite can be quite insightful if we just, you know, if people understand what this is, because we're not claiming to be economists or legal scholars, we are just like, we are anthropologists studying taxation. And they, there's a lot of space for everybody within this field. Um, yeah, so. If I may add a little bit as well to that, I, I think it's, I got a lot of interest and curiosity and then starting to probe into again, how we collect data, where our methods are as it were. Uh, then also irritation and I think that, you know, we shouldn't blend methods too much, but I think that taxation is, as someone wrote once, which I think it's obscenely complicated and therefore we find it so interesting. And if, if we can all, I mean, if our aims is more to understand taxation or different aspects of it, we can help each other from different disciplines. So we anthropologists can pose questions or propose you know, solutions or insights that an economist or legal scholar or a political scientist can bring up and address in their projects. But it's not that one discipline has all the answers to these issues. It's, but as you said, Nina, when you presented in Stockholm there last year and you said, I have experience of 40 years of field work, right? And I, I, I thought that was it was so, um, how to say, yeah, I, I really appreciated my comments because it is about, it is about knowing and then applying different methods to address these utterly complicated issues. So um, I think I'll just close this, this section of it before we open it up for questions. To, what, during each of your work over the years, is there an example of just, you know, an aha moment that just really stuck out to you, like you, you'd done enough observations that something just clicked. Um, you know, we've talked about the aha moments. Is there anything in particular? Or not? <laughs> Can I continue there? Yeah. With the nitty gritty details of doing analysis work at the tax administration. 
But this risk analysis project that I followed, they basically collected data in two ways, through a survey, where they had a call center calling up 2,000 taxpayers and replying, right? And the call center said it was really thoroughly done and they thought it was really well work, well worked through and so forth. And then the other hand, that was the a random audit control where they went out and actually did the tax control, putting 10 days for each taxpayer into this work. So it was also very thoroughly done very well, you know, uh, sample of taxpayers and so forth. And then this risk analysis group of, um, got the results from the survey on the one hand and from the uh, random audit control on the other hand, which would in their understanding sort of like illuminate on each other. But lo and behold, the results were very, very different. And basically to me, it sort of said, and this is also coming back a little bit to Eric's earlier question was that people don't at all do what they say they do. <laughs> right. And, you know, the actual confusion and astonishment among these very thoughtful risk analysis that I have a lot of respect for, that was, that was like, you know, something really silenced the whole room room after they sort of made public both the results and the further through that the aha moment came when they presented these results to the director general and instead of as they usually did publish the entire uh, result of the report he decided more or less to bury it right because it went again against the strategies of the tax administration and to my mind that sort of shows that I'm not saying that surveys are wrong all over or that random audit controls, but you should know when to combine them more. And especially when, you know, sort of they go against the strategies a tax administration go ahead with, then it really becomes, well, contagious stuff. So fascinating. Uh, for me, it was, I think I said this, but I can just say that again. Uh, it was trying to understand why there was such low compliance with this new system and getting to understand that this system was not developed for taxpayers and, and rather it was developed for tax administration it was, it was quite a big aha moment because then the question stops being why are people not using this system rather than why was the system developed uh, for the tax administration and not the taxpayers. And then once you start from there, you, you, you get to understand then why people are struggling. And even the ones who had access to Wi-Fi and access to the technology that was needed was still struggling um, with complying with the system. So the, even forget the people who were in the rural areas or the, the places that were marginalized. So just remembering that you know, this system was something that was not developed for the taxpayers for me really cemented my, my research um, and how I moved on forward um, and I think also it will be something that will be quite insightful for the tax administration to understand that it's really important to have the taxpayer in mind when designing the technology. Okay, well, I think, you know, um, unless you all want to say something more specifically on any of the points, I'm going to open it up to everybody else. And if you want to just let me know in the chat that you have a question or you want to talk and then I can unmute you and you know, here we are. Oh, let's see, Eric's written something more. Eric, you want me to unmute you so you can say it? Thank you, Nina. And well, thank you all, very great talk. I have a question related to the pandemic and I, I completely understand if you don't want to talk about that. So I, I close here if you don't want, but my question is, um, there are so many people who are hit by, by the pandemic in terms of health, work, income, et cetera. So uh, my question would be, would it be possible with, with your methods to understand now how people uh, make sense uh, about the economic stimulus measures, which are set by different uh, governments and to anticipate how they might behave uh, in the next future? 
by anticipating the narratives, the stories which they will tell uh, to justify their future behavior of uh, compliance or non-compliance. Or do you think that the methods which you, which you use in anthropology are very useful to explain the behavior once it uh, has happened, so to say, the behavior post hoc rather than the future behavior? Thank you, Tina. Can unmute me again? <laughs> Anybody want to take a stab at that? I can volunteer. And, yeah. and please, Johanna Nemo, help me out here. I mean, I, I obviously the, the start would be to talk with people who have received those and, I, and uh, receive these aids. And I don't think it's a, how to say, yes, we are perhaps saturated with COVID, but it's more important than ever to address these issues. Uh, I think, to my mind, I would start speaking with people and then trying to find places where people, despite the pandemic, actually meet and talk about these issues. That might imposs be impossible in many places because now we're going really, you know, we hibernate more or less like the beers do, but we're going so individual, so it's very difficult to interact with people. But within anthropology having said that we're also sort of on a more methodological perspective we're trying to to find alternatives to being out with people i mean there's something called an ethnography you're trying to engage with people digitally it's not at all the same of course but you know we're trying but that i i would try to do that first speak with people and then secondly try to find groups when it's possible to engage with them, where they discuss these things. Anybody? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that like any other discipline, we probably have difficult difficulties to predict exactly uh, the future. But what's common in anthropology is that you, you know, you you research the presence, you context contextualize the presence in the history you look for you know how did, 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 did how do certain factors change but it's also common to ask people about their their hopes and their their desires for the future so things can be very grim and but there's still i mean the anthropology mm -hmm. of states have often showed that within states which are you know people don't have any security and it's getting worse for for people on the lower income level they still have this desire and hope um, for redistribution, and they set this at the level of the state. So, I think these this is something which we which we would research. And on another note, I mean, I'm lecturing at the moment a class on the anthropology of taxation and, and property, and then we I look together with the students at the so-called Corona tax, which um, the chief economists of the task force of the COVID task force in Switzerland proposed to introduce for so-called corona um, for, for companies which were doing really well now during the crisis and then I asked them how they would research that and and, they, and then they said to me we can't research it because it's not happening or it's not and and then I said look I mean you could for example follow that proposal and, and see how it is perceived or how it's discussed and what are the different um, parties are saying to that proposal or where does, I mean, he's a high ranked economist in, in Switzerland. So where does he take this proposal if it, if it is already in the, in, in the paper? So that's, is, it, which is not on the level you were talking about, maybe on, on the level of, of reduced tax compliance. But if you think about it in, in terms of reduced level of tax compliance for businesses, maybe then that's also an area to, to think about. I can just add as well that in these times of the pandemic, a lot of people are having discussions on social media. And if you look at, for example, um, Kenya as an example, uh, there hasn't been any stimulus that has been given, but there's been a lot of uh, what we call COVID billionaires that have come up from stealing these funds that were actually directed to 
treating or supporting COVID responses in the country. So a lot of these COVID billionaires, there's been a lot of discussions online on social media, especially from people who are working in the informal sector about how this has impacted them. Because when there's little, there's little work for them to do and all this money has been stolen. So I would advise like going on social media and reading a lot of what people are saying there because these are real time conversations that are being had. Um, and I think frustrations, people are actually um, taking out all their frustrations online and it, it's a time to actually focus on a lot of social media research. And, and I think Lot also said conversations, that's, that's quite important, yeah. So um, Bob Gordon asked if there are papers, monographs that can be made readily available, preferably in English. And I think what we'll do, you know, we're recording this. And what I can do is when I send out to everybody the link to the recording, we can also include some links of the work that people have done so that you can read through some of this stuff. Um, Cindy Katz asks, you know, are the countries you studied reworking their systems to make them more taxpayer focused rather than tax administration focus? And Nima's shaking her head. <laughs> I, I can give the example from Kenya and say, uh, I, I feel like it's even becoming more difficult for taxpayers to comply. And they've introduced a lot of um, changes in the systems how, where they say, yeah, if you have a smartphone, you can still use the system on the smartphone. But they ask assumptions that they're making that uh, a lot of people have smartphones, which is not the case. So they're using, um, they're using data from this um, money mobile system that was introduced about um, eight years ago. So they use the data from the money mobile system to actually make justification for that everybody can be on a smartphone and this system should be easy for people to use. And it's like there's a gap between, you know, what they need and what the tax administration is doing. So I, I would say no from, from the Kenyan system, from the Kenyan side. So um, John Hasseldine, I don't know whether you want to ask your question. I think that it's a really good question. I, I was just wondering uh, if there'd been any studies on big four, um, big four international firms, uh, international accounting firms, um, partly because, uh, you know, the literature on tax accountants is that they uh, can exploit and enforce uh, in the tax compliance area. And I've always wondered whether or not uh, the firm-wide effect, the culture of working for, for example, and I don't want to pick on them, but they're the one that I know the best, PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, they would have a presumably a global culture, um, which, and, and you know, they're trying to be a socially responsible practice, et cetera, et cetera. And then of course, um, in particular countries, there are, um, there are, branches or country practices of big four firms. And I'm just wondering how an anthropologist might, might you know, start out. Um, and I don't think I'll be the one to start out doing a project like that. But if, if any of you were going to start out and do a project like that, how would you, um, how would you sort of try and tease out, um, you know, the different influences uh, in the tax practice area of a big four accounting firm? I mean, I, I had to, I mean, at the OECD, you have, um, or even at all the international tax conferences, you always have tax advisors from these big four accounting firms. So that my focus was not specifically on them, but I, you know, they would often have presentations or give you know that they need to be present in order for the people who in the audience which are um which are less known maybe advisors or companies to to make sure that they're to be seen on their advice they can give um i mean i would if i would only focus on them i would go straight to the netherlands for example or, or belgium and would try to do research especially at uh, PwC and then really follow them for you know several months maybe in, in in different patches and try to understand how they work I mean this has been done for example by a colleague of ours in New York in a Wall Street um, investment bank where she really tried to understand 
the the idea of that these investment bankers have on themselves why do they think they're so smart or why do they think they are permitted to earn so much and this is fascinating work and I mean what she did she was actually employed and did some training to that's also often the route we follow in these more expert type of areas she trained as a I mean she wasn't an investment baker but she got some kind of training and then was was able to spend a lot of time at the bank and in my interaction with these advisors they were very open to talk to me so I don't see any problem of if someone really wants to do this type of research that companies they there will be always restrictions I mean you wouldn't maybe be able to say that you are doing research in PwC but as, as we said before it's more about the larger patterns and what kind of um, general knowledge can we draw from the specific case of PwC in the Netherlands or in, in Luxembourg? That's I mean, it is of a of a project that, and I Emer Mulligan was had signed in, but I don't see her in the chat. But she had done a presentation at the IRS, and I had um, when you all had come over, and I had put a link to that video in the invitation or in the Taxpayer Rights Digest. But she did a project studying. Um, the tax advisors out in Silicon Valley um, to sort of look at, you know, how did they communicate among themselves? How did they perceive the tax agency? Some of the people had come from the IRS and or Treasury and then moved into these positions and then, you know, also interviewed people at the IRS, et cetera. And it was really fascinating because you do have that culture, but you also have the competition and um, you also have, you know, where you came from. It was a fascinating study and that that paper is written. And then I think, and this may be the same person, Johanna, that you were talking about, but a few years ago at ATAX, the Australia conference, um, there was a presentation by a woman that had actually gotten her um, credentials in doing financial planning and law, you know, great wealth financial planning, and then sort of embedded her, if you will, among the planners that were really actively doing planning for moving to tax havens. And so some of them, you know, named in the Panama Papers, et cetera, and described, you know, the conversations, you know, the way people looked at their work, how they viewed their clients. Um, and it was really fascinating to see that culture um, uh, as well. And, you know, that sort of goes also to Johanna, you know, you're saying you have to also have some expertise in order to understand some of these things. Um, but there is work going on in that. I'll send that link out again when I send out this video, because the, the presentations for that day, everybody was here for that, you know, um, was were very good. Maybe I, I can just add one thing because you mentioned culture and then you mentioned the word competition and I think for us it would be we would we, we would conceive the comp competition as part of the culture you know what are the constraints these people are working under you know why do they do certain things or other people think as that this is aggressive tax planning you know who thinks this is aggressive tax planning where are the rules being set for that something why suddenly I mean the, the the people from KPMG, they were also getting, they understood that people are saying that they're doing aggressive tax planning, but for 25 years, no one was talking so loudly about aggressive tax planning. So it was also interesting to see how they had to cope with this accusation or suddenly this link that there's a link between um, equality, development, taxation, or corporate social responsibility and taxation, which they didn't have to deal with before, at least that's what, how they, told the story yeah. right right um i have a comment from giovanna so giovanna i'm going to unmute you yeah hi everybody uh i want to thank you all of you really great deep insights um i just was wondering uh, nina mentioned the special forums in the u.s here in Italy, we have some public debates and a lot of the work, um, I know there are some town halls in order to get more interaction with the uh, taxpayers. From an anthropologist point of view, what do you uh, think are the key tools uh, um, 
more effective or more resolutive to really engage taxpayer during that kind of forums. Thank you. Can I go first there perhaps? Thank you, Gio Giovanna. Great to see you also, well, seven years ago. <laughs> um, I think the, the important thing when you come to, I mean, we are interested on how people do things together in community as a collective, as a culture, as it were. And being there, listening to people, participant observation, it's not only observation, it's being there participating and, and trying to engage with, with them, listening what they talk about, what their concerns are, talk with them, gather also the information prior to such meetings, what brought them there in the first place, right? And what was the takeaway? So yes, jump in, hang out. Sounds very yeah. unscientific, but that is, is what it's all about, of trying really to understand why people do as they do. Yeah, and if I can give an example from my own research is the issue of ITAX was something quite sensitive. So every time I would bring it up to a taxpayer, you know, I felt like I was a shrink or something. All this information, all this, um, everything that they felt, you know, and so you just had to sit and listen because I did not have a solution for them, but they felt better talking about it and, you know, going around with them to service centers, you know, trying to understand how they're navigating in this problem, but really gaining a deep understanding of what the real problem is and how they perceive the issue at hand. Because for me, ITAX was not a problem. I am a Swedish taxpayer. So I was just there for my research, but for them, it was something that they were really grappling with. And um, from one of them being somebody who was accused of tax uh, cheating, and having, she was trying to comply, but the system was not helping her comply. So just having somebody listen to her and, and follow her around was something that she found quite helpful. Um, and, and not so much the advice I was giving her because that was next to nothing, but somebody was open and understanding and uh, that was quite helpful. So really getting to the bottom of what the problem is and, uh, and, it, and it entails a lot of reading because you have to also, before you go to the field, you have to really understand what's, be, what's being talked about, uh, what's the real issue. And for me, a lot of the issues were being written in the media. Um, Kenya uses a lot of media to communicate to the taxpayers. So it involves reading the newspapers, reading the blogs, just to kind of understand what people are saying contra what the tax administration is saying about this issue. So, yeah. And also learning this, uh, what I call the buzzwords and fuzzwords of taxation. So for you to be able to understand what they're talking about, you have to really understand the code because not everything is, is going to be as we understand, right? So that's the advice I can give. You know, I can just say that in my own, you know, again, with the public forums, uh, we always went out with, okay, maybe we'll talk, you know, this is sort of the theme of the public forum, but you learned very quickly that it didn't matter what you thought, you know, everybody had something to say. And I could have chosen to push, you know, force everybody to get into my preconceived, we're going to discuss this topic, but that wasn't the reason for going out there. That was just a beginning framework to get the conversation started. And what was more important was where the conversation went. And, you know, there was one public forum that we had, and I, it was in Los Angeles, and um, we had over 100 people there. And we were going to talk about one particular thing. And the whole thing came about to talk about identity theft and being victims of identity theft through the tax system and refund fraud. And the, the, physic, the feelings in that room, it was exhausting to be there. Um, and afterwards, just people coming up and standing and everybody having a story. And you just felt like it was absolutely necessary to be a sponge and listen to everybody's story, that that was the most important information that I could have at that time. Now, it wasn't necessarily data that I could use, but how I used that was that we had a court reporter at every single public forum. And I, in my annual reports, actually 
took sections, you know, took quotes from what people actually said and put them organized under things that the IRS said that they wanted to do and then said, well, you know, here's what the taxpayers have said. You know, here's the taxpayer in Red Oak, Iowa that I am willing to say not a lot of people have been to, but I have, you know, um, here's what they think. And it was, you know, it was compelling. It was not a statistically representative sample, but it was compelling. So I think we have someone who wants to tell us a tax story. I'm going to, I, I don't know your name, YLN, you may know her. I'm going to unmute you, you unmute and chat with us. You have to unmute yourself. Thank you very much, all of you. It's so very interesting. And Lotta, thank you, because, and all, all the other, others too, of course, but Lotta and I have met a lot of times. So I'm, it's, uh, it's very interesting to listen. And I must tell you, <clears throat> I have read your article in our tax journal, a Swedish tax journal this year. It was very interesting about this, what you're talking about. And I must add, add that I am a practitioner and have 30 years of experience, <laughs> as well as, of course, I am an academic in Örebro University. And I, I worked a lot, so it's very interesting to read the stories about the Swedish tax agency. And uh, now I was thinking about the story uh, because Lotta, you wrote that um, uh, people can irritate on specific taxes uh, and you wrote spe specifically benefit taxes. In Sweden, we have some benefit tax that everything you get from your employer must be taxed in a special way of valuing. And in this Corona time, people were very, very angry because there was um, uh, restaurants and uh, other places where they had food and lunches and they gave it to the, the nurses and the doctors at the hospitals for free. But when the employer, the hospital owner, gave it to the nurses and the doctors, they had to pay tax for it. But as you wrote, Lotta, uh, the Swedish tax agency listens. So they took it away. They made an exception. Isn't that wonderful? Now in Corona times. Yeah, I thought I must tell you this story. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Yvonne. Yeah. <laughs> Bilva. All right. So, um, Let's see, do we have any other comments or questions? Do our guests wanna say anything in closing? Um, I just wanna add something to, uh, with regards to the question Giovanna asked, because I think there's also um, a number of anthropological articles which show quite well the idea that why people are not complying is that, that they're very diverse ideas why people don't want to comply or can't even, you know, for example, pay tax. And I, I could also add this, this literature to the list um, you know, as compiling, because I think if you, in these town, hall, uh, town halls or public debates, if you had come already with an understanding which for the reasons why people don't comply, which are maybe non-economic. There, there might be about representation or they might be about the history, what, what, what also Nimo mentioned earlier, how your experiences with tax. So there's also a great article about Italy. Maybe you know this, uh, the person I can, I can add it to the list. And I think this is also helpful to make the, the actual debate slightly wider. And then I think what, what Nina said in the end, you know, the, the, the moments when people come up to you afterwards, I mean, these are for all of us, the most important um, moments that you make yourself available to people who don't wanna raise their hand in a big forum, or these are the, they don't want to talk about in front of everyone why they maybe don't, can't pay tax or what are the specific moments the, the non-compliant or they may be slightly illegal, they can't, they don't want to put them out in, into the public. And even at the OECD where you have uh, large public consultation meetings with 100, 180 people in a room, I mean, all the people who want the input from the business side, they mentioned what people say on record is not really interesting for them. They have heard that before, but the moments when then they come up to them afterwards and say, hey, this, this is how I really see it. I mean, this is unfortunately 
how many human social circles work that the that these silent informal parts are them are, are often very yeah important anybody else want to chime in i would just like to add to ilva's comment there of of sort of saying also that tax cultures in all our different countries are so very diverse. Yeah. I mean, the story she offered there about the Swedish tax administration being very nitpicky and in this times generous about not taxing these free given lunches as fringe benefits would for most tax administrations, for most countries in the world just seem utterly absurd, right? But this is, you know, I mean, thinking about this is, in Swedish, it's very much a question of fairness. And fairness then is articulated differently in our country than it is in most other countries. I mean, Nimo and I, and also Johanna and I, we have had numerous conversations about the differences between our countries. Switzerland, Sweden seem quite similar, yet mm, different. Kenya, we won't even start talking about similar tax culture, right? And, and to, to try to untangle and understand what makes this so different. And this is really where we can try to make a difference or a contribution, I think, with our research. Okay. Nima, you wanna add anything before we go? I think uh, everything has been said. I, I would just add that, um, because we take uh, taxation so seriously and understanding the not only the taxpayer, but the tax administration and everybody who is involved within this, um, within the discipline, it enables us to navigate from different, uh, di different perspectives and we, we can, we can be like, okay, so this is what the tax administration is struggling with. This is what the taxpayers are struggling. With. So kind of build a bridge between what is being said and what is being done. So I feel like that's a quite important um, aspect to focus on. And within, with my own work, I remember actually feeling sorry for the tax administration. A lot of people had a lot of anger towards the tax administration, but once I was working with them, going to the, to the headquarters uh, on, on almost a daily basis, I really understood like, you know, the, the things that they were struggling with. And I, I could not tell that to the taxpayers, of course, but I felt quite sympathetic towards a lot of the, the responsibility that they had and a lot of the, the lack of connection they had with the taxpayers and, and the kind of perception that people had about what they were doing. So if I had not engaged with them at that level, I'll not be able to actually say, you know what, they are actually having quite a hard time with the work that they're doing. So, you know, we should cut them some slack. Although that was not, that's not a quite popular, uh, <laughs> Uh, take away, but I feel like in order to grow or to to help, you know, create more healthy tax environments, we have to really be able to tease those things out. How can we develop a healthy relationship between the tax administration and the, and the, and the taxpayers? And how can these insights help, you know, create a, a better environment? So I think anthropology has really helped, you know, tease out those things for me. This was just absolutely wonderful. And I wanna thank each of you for doing this. And um, what I, uh, we will post this and going forward, we will have other programs with our tax anthropologists, the other members of the group. And I'm really grateful to you all for sharing your knowledge and your experience. And I look forward to working with you a lot more in the future. I just have enjoyed my work with you all. So thank you so much. And thank you everyone for attending. This is great. It makes us feel a little bit closer in this very distanced world. So um, we will see you in a month or so. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nina. Yes. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ciao. <laughs>